Good morning, everyone. At least good morning in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, my apologies for the slight delay. Uh, my name is Shobita Parthasarathy. I'm professor of public policy and the director of the science, technology, and public policy program known as STPP here at the Ford School of Public Policy. STPP is an interdisciplinary university-wide program dedicated to training students, conducting cutting-edge research, and informing the public and policymakers on issues at the intersection of technology, science, equity, society, and public policy. If you'd like to learn more about it, you can do so at our website, stpp.fordschool.umich.edu, uh, and we will drop that uh, link into uh, the chat. Before I introduce today's event, I wanna make a couple of quick announcements. First, for those of you who are interested in our graduate certificate program, the next deadline is March 1st of next year, and we'll be holding an information session about it on Tuesday, February 15th at 4 p.m. You can access registration details on our website. It will be held via Zoom. Second, the next event in the STPP lecture series during this academic year will feature Kumar Garg, Managing Director at Schmidt Futures and the former Assistant Director in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. That event will be on Wednesday, January 26th at 4 p.m. And you can also register for that on our website. And now for today's event, we are hosting an important and timely conversation about global vaccine equity and health justice. Our featured guest today is social justice activist and human rights lawyer, Fatima Hassan, who is the founder of the Health Justice Initiative in South Africa. An expert in human rights, especially in the context of HIV AIDS, Hassan has provided services to the AIDS Law Project and the Treatment Action Campaign and was former co-director and founding trustee of Nidifuna Ukwazi. She has also served on the boards of the Wraith Foundation, South African Medicine Sans Frontiers, the International Treatment Preparedness Co Coalition, and the South Af African Council for Medical Schemes. She has a BA and LLB from the University of Witwaterstrand and an LLM from Duke University and clerked for Justice Kate O'Regan of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. She also served as special advisor to former Minister Barbara Hogan. Over the last two years, she has been a fierce campaigner advocating for global health equity through relaxing intellectual property restrictions on the COVID vaccines and increasing sharing and manufacturing capacity to low and middle income countries. And as you can imagine, just in the last week or so, she has become even busier than that. Um, yesterday, she gave, um, she did an interview with Farid Zakaria on CNN, and she just joined us this morning uh, from uh, speaking with the WHO. In conversation with her will be Dr. Abdul Al Sayed, Harry A. and Margaret D. Towsley Foundation policy, Policymaker in Residence at the Ford School of Public Policy here at University of Michigan. Dr. Al Sayed is a physician, academic, and public servant who served as executive director of the Detroit Health Department and health officer for the city from 2015 to 2017. He was previously assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at Columbia University. In 2018, followed by, following a bid for governor of Michigan, he founded Southpaw Michigan, a political action committee aimed at helping pro elect progressive candidates. And in 2020, he served on the Biden-Sanders Unity Task Force on Healthcare. He's currently a political contrib contributor for CNN and the author of two books, Healing Politics, A Doctor's Journey into the Heart of Our Political Pandemic and Medicare for All, A Citizen's Guide, which he co-authored with Micah Johnson. He also hosts a podcast about politics and health called America Dissected with Dr. El Syed. Before we begin, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors at the African Study Center, the Office of Global Public Health, and the Center for Global Health Equity for making this event possible. I also want to thank our STPP staff, Mariam Nagaran and Molly Kleiman. Ms. Hassan and Dr. El Sayed will talk for about 30 minutes, and then there'll be time for audience questions and engagement afterwards. Please submit any questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. Ms. Hassan, Dr. El Sayed, I'm so looking forward to your conversation, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Shobita. It's a, a privilege and honor to be here uh, with you and, and grateful for your leadership. 
um, of, uh, of, uh, in this area. Uh, really excited to be in conversation uh, with Ms. Uh, Fatima Hassan, really looking forward to uh, what I know is going to be an important conversation, particularly in, in, in this moment. Um, I, I want to just jump right in. Uh, I, I um, first, actually, I, I'm not seeing uh, Miss uh, Hassan here, so I just want to make sure that she is here with us. It looks like she is not. Oh, you are here. Just a, just a minute. We're gonna figure out audio and video. Okay, I think we've, I yep. think we've succeeded. Yes, <laughs> there it is. All right. Oh, yeah, what a day. It, 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 sometimes those days happen, but we're really grateful that, uh, that you're here with us now. Let's jump right in. Uh, so obviously, um, the, 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 the world was turned upside down uh, last week. Uh, I can't believe it's, it's been only a week uh, with the uh, recognition of the emergence of the Omicron variant of, uh, of the coronavirus. And uh, it was discovered um, in large part because of South Africans, uh, scientists and, um, and, and epidemiologists uh, focus on the capacity for genomic surveillance and, um, and doing the good work of telling the world about uh, what they had identified, although it remains unclear exactly where the variant emerged. Can you um, give us a picture of what has transpired over the last week? We know that cases have uh, started to skyrocket there. Um, what is the situation on the ground as you all are experiencing right now? Thanks, and thanks Abdul and uh, the rest of the team for organizing this webinar. And sorry for all the technical problems. It's been a, a day of uh, intermittent internet access, uh, coupled with an increase in infections because of the new variant. And like you mentioned earlier, that South African scientists, as well as uh, but science from Botswana first alerted the world to, to the variant. So the variant wasn't discovered in South Africa. It was just first reported from parts of Southern Africa. It's now transpired, uh, as you would have seen, I think it's the irony of, of the Dutch authorities basically holding a plane from South Africa on the tarmac for multiple hours and requiring everybody to test themselves and then either quarantine or, you know, there were other measures implemented that the variant was actually circulating in the Netherlands a week before uh, it was actually discovered in the skills in parts of, of uh, Southern Africa. So the mood on the ground is, you know, um, basically one of real anger, I think, because on the one hand, our scientists have played a significant role because of the advanced genomic available systems we have in sharing data, not being secretive and being transparent. Uh, but the response has been, you know, frankly, one that smacks of racism, right? The knee-jerk travel ban that has included most Southern African countries. I mean, it's so, it's so laughable if, if, if it wasn't so um, incredulous. Um, but not countries where the variant has already been found and where the variant is circulating. And what we know so far is that, in, I mean, you would know this better, you're an epidemiologist, is that there's already community transmission and it's now found in multiple parts of the world and it's certainly not limited to, to Southern Africa. But I think that the response to the disclosure of the information and the increase in the number of transmissions in our parts of the world has been the response of the world from the beginning of this pandemic, which is, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk left and we'll walk right. So it's a, it's a language of double speak that will offer you solidarity, but instead what we'll do is we'll either isolate you, we'll either unfairly discriminate against your countries, or we'll deny you access to life-saving vaccines at the same time as the rest of you would get access to. And so, you know, the the worst thing that could have happened is we get the travel ban and then we find out that more booster shots have actually been administered in the last four months in the global north than first shots have been actually administered in Southern Africa and, and, and the rest of Africa. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. So yeah, if you want to understand why people in Southern Africa and particularly South Africa and Botswana are furious 
um, you know, that's that's just some of the context for for where we're at. I really appreciate that point, and I, I think the uh, the point uh, about context is an important one. And I think sometimes when we talk about COVID nineteen, we act as if this was the first global uh, pandemic in our lifetimes, and it was not. Um, in fact, uh, the, the 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 one that we should also often be paying attention to to understand the circumstances that are arising here at the at the meeting point between global geopolitics and economics is HIV AIDS. It's just we don't call it a pandemic simply because we undervalue the lives that it infected, whether it was uh, LGBTQ people here at, uh, at home or uh, Black folks abroad. And um, can you give us a sense of the way that uh, HIV AIDS as a global phenomenon has sort of set the stage for the public understanding of this moment and what lessons we can glean as we get into the particularities of uh, of, 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 of this particular pandemic and the vaccine? Thanks. I mean, great question. You know, the most obvious similarity between the HIV AIDS crisis and this pandemic has been one of inequity, right? And so the HIV AIDS response was characterized by a delay or in a refusal to acknowledge the seriousness of the epidemic first in uh, white gay men in the US and then later on black and brown people, uh, both uh, LGBTI communities as well as heterosexual communities and particularly black women in Africa and that was sort of uh, towards the early 2000s and late 2000s. But the one common characteristic between the two pandemics when I talk about inequality is just the lack of access. And so, you know, you will find that the people who had been working on access to HIV AIDS treatment, affordable supplies, timely supplies, greater manufacturing, you know, the same themes that we've seen in COVID, uh, the similar group of people have rejoined basically to fight for access to, you know, equity, to equitable access to tests, to so diagnostics, to treatment and vaccines in this pandemic. Because, you know, one of the reasons we did that was because we saw what that would what impact that would have the stranglehold of intellectual property the inability to be able to access life-saving technologies on a timely basis it basically costs you lives i mean forget the money and forget the economies but you just have needless suffering and you have needless death i mean we've seen in this pandemic already at least five million deaths we think that that's an underestimate we think that there's an underestimate of, of global cases as well because that requires you know testing capability and capacity um, but the similarities um, are so much so that it's the same companies, you know, the, the fights that we're having, it almost feels deja vu for me of, of what we had to deal with 20 years ago. It's the same practice manual of the CEOs of the pharmaceutical companies, maybe the individuals may have changed, but it's the same arguments, it's the same tactics, it's the same racist tropes that are being flung about. I mean, the most recent thing is that you know, in, in, in the minds of CEOs, which is what they told us in HIV is that there isn't an issue with uh, supplies or scaling up manufacturing or that it's not their fault that there's this uneven uh, access to vaccines around the world, that it's our fault, that we don't want to take the vaccine, that we are hesitant, that we are anti-vaxxers. Without understanding the global context in which we're in, you know, many of the anti-vax movements that are alive in South Africa have their roots in the US, have their roots in groups uh, I mean, you saw what happened in Germany in the last 24 hours. So, you know, the, there's a there's a real far right wing fascist movement around individual liberties about uh, people who are opposed to mask mandates, people who are opposed to vaccine man mandates. And so the, the issue of systemic power, the issue of politics, the issue of racism, the issue of keeping out black people through travel bans, you know, I don't know if you saw both the German and Spanish newspapers had these really racist cartoons about keeping black people out because of the new variant. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the irony was that it was actually circulating in Europe before. So, I mean, I can I can speak to you for hours about the similarities, but, but let me just basically say that the same issues that we had around intellectual property being the greatest barrier to timely access and uh, timely supplies of the things that could take you out of a pandemic is the same thing we're seeing in this particular pandemic. And I just want to, you know, emphasize the word timely, because if you're getting your vaccine in January and I'm getting my vaccine in December, that's 11 months apart. This is why we have variants. This is why we've created the fertile ground for variants to emerge and, and for them to circulate. And this is what we were trying to emphasize 
from last year already as the people vaccine alliance globally that timing in this pandemic is so important otherwise you can have a situation like hiv aids where you wait 10 years five years three years for access to the same things that you can benefit from in the rich north uh, which in the meantime basically not just cost your lives but it's also costing us um you know it's costing us in, in new variants I want to, um, there, there's a lot uh, of really important, um, very rich analysis that you just offered here. And I want to, I want to uh, break that down a little bit. I, I just want to start first with, um, with the role of, of intellectual property and the way that this debate has yet again, uh, fallen on the question of control and the question of uh, a profit. Um, you know, you've been a leader in trying to uh, get COVID-19 vaccines distributed more widely, more equitably, uh, in particular to low and middle income countries. Um, and toward that end, as a mechanism, you've supported waiving intellectual property rights uh, for the corporations that, that, um, that hold on to these patents. And uh, that implies sharing the know-how and then also building manufacturing facilities in low and middle income countries. Um, can you speak to the role of the TRIPS waiver in particular, uh, explain what that is and uh, and why waiving it, uh, waiving trips is, is the best approach here? Thanks. So I think it also links to your previous question about the HIV AIDS crisis and the lessons we learned from this in that pandemic, that if you don't actually deal with the systemic issues and the rules of the global trade system, which is basically contained in something called the TRIPS agreement, which is part of the World Trade Organization, a global trade body with member states, and you know most states are members of the World Trade Organization, so that they can basically trade uh, as as supposed equal trading partners. So the idea with the trips waiver was that quite early on, because of the lessons of the H HIV AIDS crisis, so quite early on in this pandemic, there was a recognition that if you don't address the issue of IP barriers, and it's not just patents, it's copyright trade secrets, there's a range of elements that make up intellectual property protection. If those are not suspended, just temporarily, just for the duration of this pandemic, just for essential COVID-19 technologies, then you're going to have greater obstacles to be able to scale up access and to be able to scale up manufacturing. It, it relates to PPE, it relates to ventilators, it relates to diagnostic test kits. Uh, there's a lot of focus on vaccines, but that's just one part of it. So in October of last year already, before the vaccines were even approved for use or were given emergency use authorization, there was a proposal made by the South African and Indian government to ask member states to temporarily suspend intellectual property protection so that you could create an equal playing field that you wouldn't have to worry in each country about possible IP or patent infringement of a particular company's uh, technology and we'll come to whose technology it is, right? Because there's a there's a huge debate around does Moderna own the IP, does the US government own it, does AstraZeneca own the IP, or does um, Oxford University own it, given the amounts of public investment. And in many cases, we argue that the people of Britain and the people of the US actually own the vaccine, it's the people's vaccine, because public money is used to research it. Um, but that aside, the idea was to have a very quick, easy way so that we wouldn't all have to do issue compulsory licenses and fight for voluntary licenses and fight for the right to scale up manufacturing using capacity that exists in Latin America, in Asia, and Africa to also scale up production so that you're not just reliant on a plant in Baltimore, ironically, which became one of the greatest Achilles heels of the Johnson & Johnson rollout, right, because of the contamination issue there. Or you're not just reliant on a plant in Leiden, for example, in Europe, uh, but you could also then use other capacity. And it's been blocked. It's been blocked for over a year by the very countries that wanted accelerated vaccine research, that are administering booster shots, uh, that are promising donations to us, but don't want to deal with the bigger systemic issues. So we've got what we had in the HIV AIDS crisis, a crisis again of equity and a crisis of power because the people who are actually calling the shots, and you know, we've been very vocal about this, are four white men who are the CEOs of these pharmaceutical companies who come from the rich north. They are deciding markets, they are deciding prices, they are deciding what indemnification they want, what liability protection they want, they are deciding whether the contract is open or not open, whether there's non-disclosure agreements, 
they also decide where supplies go to first. So there's no transparency on delivery schedules. I mean, we call that delivery visibility. Um, and this is the reason why when we've had to rely on a handful of manufacturers without the IP relaxation, without the TRIPS waiver, why it's been a really difficult battle to be able to scale up manufacturers. That has resulted in a drip feed of supplies to Africa and parts of Latin America and South Africa. For the better part of the year, up until October, we had a drip feed of supplies. The data is on our website at Health Justice Initiative. So you can actually see based on the numbers, the Affinity has, has given this data, the Economist has provided this data, our world in data, you know, has all of the different tables. The evidence is there of the drip feed of supplies of vaccines into low-income countries, and COVAX too has been unable to, you know, meet supplies. So at the heart of it is we would have been in a very different situation if that waiver had been approved in December, had it been approved in January, February. In fact, even if it's approved right now, we could be in a different situation in, in two years time because what's clear with the variant is we, we all gonna have to get booster shots, right? So the market for vaccines has just, um, I think tripled. <laughs> I, I, I wanna um, jump into this, right? Because the opponents of, 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 of a TRIPS waiver uh, include um, a number of, of, of high-income countries, the Gates Foundation, obviously the pharmaceutical industry, and they make a number of claims to, to, uh, to defend their position here. They say, well, the capacity to manufacture vaccines is limited in low- and middle-income countries. They say that the, uh, the real limitation to vaccine access isn't actually the vaccine supply. It's uh, the last mile problem, as they say. They say that, uh, you know, it, 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 it would, um, it would uh, slow the capacity to, uh, to address and, 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 and pivot if we needed to in the face of a new variant. Um, that's what they say. Uh, I, I'm hoping maybe you can respond to some of these, uh, some of these uh, uh, um, uh, assertions that they make and tell us what, why they really do oppose uh, the TRIPS waiver. Sure. Okay. So that's a, a lot of questions uh, wrapped into one. Let me let me take them one at a time. So the this assumption that the global south can't make diagnostic kits or vaccines or treatments is we believe um, wrong, and it's wrong because we think it's rooted in a lot of racism and a lot of myths about what our true capacity for production is. There's been an executive piece done by Stephanie Nolan of the New York Times, who basically went around the world and spoke to all available manufacturing partners and showed that there's ample existing manufacturing capacity, even in Africa. The WHO invited expressions of interest from partners in the global south, as well as in the global north, to be participants in what's called the mRNA WHO hubs, one of which, which has actually been set up in South Africa. But Pfizer and Moderna are bypassing them. They refuse to cooperate and share their technology. Uh, there are companies in Latin, in Latin America that were told the same thing in the HIV AIDS crisis, companies in Asia, companies in Africa. So, so we believe that there are companies around the world, including even a company in Canada, who said that they're willing to manufacture vaccines for a country like Bolivia. But the Canadian government refuses to take on the power of Johnson & Johnson and issue a license because Johnson & Johnson refuses to voluntarily give a license to this company. So the one thing we've been dealing with is this, uh, you know, this, this, this myth that there isn't capacity and we've shown that there is and that this is an incorrect assumption. The second is that if you ask the company nicely, they'll give you a license. That's been the furthest from the truth. Every single effort has been attempted with the CEOs of these companies to voluntarily share their technology, to transfer the knowledge, to participate in the mRNA hubs, they refuse. So when I said earlier, the CEOs are playing God in this pandemic and they make all the decisions, they will bypass an mRNA hub that has been set up to scale up mRNA vaccines and instead do bilateral deals with one or two companies which, which have limitations on geography, limitations on volumes, and usually those licenses are fully finished, they're not even full, full manufacturing licenses. So the reason why we believe, coming to you know, the second part of your question, why there is such an existential 
crisis in the pharmaceutical community and why they are lobbying so hard with the support of people like Bill Gates, because his foundation has now done a U-turn and they've now said they're in support of the relaxation of IP, but there are certain global uh, philanthropists uh, who unfortunately put a lot of money into global health and they have had a chilling effect on the ability of people to speak out in support of the waiver. But notwithstanding what Bill Gates has to think, I mean, the Vatican supports a relaxation of IP, Nobel laureates support that, 100 countries do, former world leaders do. So I really think that Bill Gates and people who believe uh, what he does in relation to this waiver, he's called it the stupidest idea in inverted commas. He said it's naive and foolish. Uh, will one day be judged as you know being on the wrong side of history. But, but we believe that the real reason why the industry and a few global leaders, the US, the UK, Norway, Switzerland, um, and obviously the EU, particularly Germany, and uh, the UK, Boris Johnson, are so opposed to the way that it's a handful of nations blocking what 100 countries, 110 countries now actually want. Um, it's because if you allow this waiver, I think in their mind, then you basically say that intellectual property is secondary to human rights and to the right to life. And if you allow this in this pandemic, I think there is a fear on their part that they will never be able to claw back on the excessive protections and exclusivity that IP gives you on life-saving medicines. Because if you open the door in this pandemic on COVID-19 technologies, then the next we're going to want is flexibilities on any other life-saving medicine. And this is the battle we've had for the last 30, 40 years about the, the what happened was really immoral and unethical to include medicines into the TRIPS agreement. It wasn't always like that. It was a, the role of Pfizer and its CEO at that time that basically brought intellectual property protections on pharmaceutical products. So the pharmaceutical industry is very powerful. It's more profitable than oil and gas. It's a really powerful industry. I mean, you've seen the billions that, that all of these companies have made in the last year. The announcement of the variant actually made the stock value of Moderna shoot up. Right. So there is the bottom line reason for why these companies and their lobbyists and they've gone to Congress to even the US Congress to say that they don't support the waiver. They, I, I think that for them, this is an existential crisis. And finally, I think linked to you, it's what we saw with HIV AIDS. If you waive IP, you give up control and you give up power. You can't then choose which partners, which country, which markets. And, and our assessment of the industry at the moment is they want absolute control. And that manifests in the way in which they, you know, they've given these partial licenses as well. But let me stop there if, if you want to delve into that a bit deeper. No, I, I really appreciate that. And I, you know, I think uh, folks who have been thinking about, um, about prescription drug policy in this country see uh, an obvious set of parallels. Uh, the, the, the prescription drug industry has spent 4.3 billion, that's with a B, uh, in lobbying alone over the past 20 years. And we're having a robust conversation right now in the course of the Build Back Better uh, package about whether or not Medicare, the single largest buyer of prescription drugs, should have the right to negotiate prescription drugs on behalf of seniors in this country, um, many of whom report, a third of whom report, uh, rationing their uh, medications because they can't afford it. And so it is the same kind of uh, greed that we see um, that focuses only simply on corporate bottom lines. That despite the irony uh, of the fact that we, uh, largely the American taxpayers, are, uh, are, are investing in the research that then turns into uh, these prescription drugs. And the, the thing that I, I think it's important to remember is that prescription drug companies spend more on marketing than they do on research and, uh, and, 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 and um, development of their products. And uh, it's everything that you need to understand about what they are. These are large, in effect, uh, private equity firms. They take investments in biomedical uh, uh, compounds, and the ones that pan out end up paying for everything else and some. And, um, uh, and here we are, and it's keeping uh, people in this country from getting access to their medications, and it's keeping people uh, abroad from getting access to this vaccine in the context of a global pandemic. Where are we now on the TRIPS waiver conversation? Is there... Uh, some light at the end of this very dark, um, you know, Greek alphabet laden tunnel, or uh, or are we right back where we were? 
Yeah, so, I mean, I think the next variant they should call inequality, right? Because I think that's, that's where we are. Um, so we were the supposed Iota variant. To... <laughs> yeah. Um, vaccine apartheid is alive and well. So we were supposed to have the WTO ministerial meeting, it's called MT12, about a week ago, but just on the eve of everybody actually getting on the plane to go to Geneva to have this yet another meeting, which this time was going to be in person to trash out, hopefully, uh, the final text of the TRIPS waiver, the variant emerge, and that's when everybody uh, was banned and basically the meeting has been postponed indefinitely. Of course, the push by activists and advocates like us, uh, you know, is that, and, and this campaign has really been led by people who work at Third World Network, by the South Center, by MSF Access Campaign, and obviously groups in the, U in the US like Prep for All and Health Gap and IMAC, who, uh, you know, incidentally have also done a lot of the work around prescription medicines in the US and the issue of ever greening patterns and uh, have really been lobbying the US Congress around the reforming the entire US patent and medicine regulatory and pricing system, because that has an impact on us. You know, whatever happens in the US, with what Gilead does or Pfizer or JJ has a direct impact on, on us and our ability to access affordable medicine. So where we at with the waiver is that the meeting that was supposed to trash all of this out has now been postponed. We are saying that you don't need to have an in-person meeting. You can have a virtual meeting on Zoom and you can pass this waiver. Um, we're getting to the point where 110 countries support the waiver. Like we said, there are a few blockers, um, and we're trying to increase the pressure on these governments in, in, in relation to why they continue blocking it, because they really are on the wrong side of history. Um, and if the blocking continues beyond the end of this year, then I think, one, it tells us that the world's priorities are really not about um, equity in this pandemic or global solidarity, even though they promised that, but it's more about um, prioritizing IP claims. Uh, but the second option is to actually call for a vote. So the WTO operates on a model of consensus building, but actually you can pass the waiver by, by going to vote. The, the, the spanner in the works is that your government, the Biden administration, decided earlier this year, which was significant and not so significant, you know, time will tell. One day when we all write the books about this pandemic, um, we'll have to see whether Biden's move, you know, was, was strategic or whether it was really rooted in trying to actually save lives. And the, U the, the U.S. indicated through Catherine Tai, the, the WTO, the trade ambassador, um, that they would support a partial waiver, but only in relation to vaccines, um, not in relation to all other medical technologies. And so that position, the US as somewhat kind of in the middle of, well, we'll support you on some part, but not everything, while the EU and the UK is holding out, and the EU in response, it's, it's quite incredulous. Um, you know, the EU, particularly because of the position of Germany, Switzerland, Norway, uh, and then obviously also the UK and the Boris Johnson administration has been about protecting pharmaceutical interests and protecting that technology has said that we shouldn't use the waiver as the mechanism. We should use something called the third way. And the third way is the EU's uh, supposed solution to dealing with a fast moving pandemic by all of a sudden now, 25 years later, after we've been asking for compulsory licenses, you know, on HIV AIDS medicine, to use compulsory licensing as a mechanism to try and uh, deal with every single access issue, which is not feasible. Compulsory licensing mechanisms have rarely ever been used successfully when you see what's happening in Canada. And when you do try and invoke a compulsory licensing measure, then usually what happens is the pharmaceutical industry lawyers up and you know you basically spend years in court before you can even uh, try and achieve that. So um, I'm not. I mean, on the one hand, I'm trying to be optimistic, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. the situation is getting worse. More people are getting sick and dying. We really don't have sufficient supplies of vaccines, let alone diagnostic kits. And, you know, we worry that next year we're going to now start treatment apartheid, not just vaccine apartheid, uh, as, as the FDA is looking at data around uh, what, what Merck and, and Pfizer basically announced as pre their preliminary data on some of the antivirus. I want to ask you, so on that front, uh, we, we saw that um, Merck in particular uh, agreed to offer um, licenses 
uh, for manufacturing abroad, in effect, bypassing this TRIPS waiver question. Um, do you have, do you feel like that is an effort to get ahead of uh, this particular issue and, um, and then create sort of an alternative uh, system that they can then game? Or do you feel like this is in good faith? So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll never regard any action by a pharmaceutical company in the middle of a pandemic as necessarily one of good faith. And the reason why I say that is when you look at the terms and conditions of that particular license, which we believe is quite restrictive and excludes multiple countries and at least about 40% of the world population. So the, the way we view that particular move is that one, it's around trying to get ahead, like you said, of the trips waiver and the demand for the lifting of IP protections to be in total control. Uh, of the geographies, of the terms of the licensing, and to try and control who, who the partners are in this particular configuration of actors. Um, and it's not a universal, non-exclusive, general access license. If it was, then I would be the first to say, well done, Merth, you've actually done the first you know, universal, non-exclusive license. But that is not the case. Similarly with Pfizer. So they've, they pick and choose countries, like you're picking, you know, fruits in a, in a supermarket and which countries are in the territory, which countries are not in the territory. The issue, obviously, for Latin America is that Brazil, bizarrely, has been excluded from the territories of the licenses. Um, so what it does, these licenses, if they're not if they're not done in a way which is totally non-exclusive and universal, which says everybody can share the technology and everybody can use it everywhere, is it cre then creates domestic obstacles. So if you're a territory that's been excluded, for example, in the one license that we got um, with, with Pfizer, they said only the South African public sector can be in the territory. Now, a lot of people in South Africa use what's called the private sector, even low-income workers, because they are low-income medical schemes. So it then becomes even more difficult for activists in each country to be able to access a cheap generic version of those treatments, right? Given what they estimate to cost in the private market, $700 for a five-day regimen, for example, there's already warning bells around who is going to be able to access them, when and at what price. And this goes back to the battles we had with the HIV movement. So, so no, I don't, I don't necessarily see them in total good faith. And I think what they do is they segment markets. And that is the problem with restricted licensing. If you create further uh, segmentation, you create a further division in countries, within countries and, and across countries. But I can guarantee you that you'll get those treatments before we'll be able to get our hands on them. And you know it will take us years before we can access the same kind of treatment regimens that you'll be able to. But in your own country, of course, you're going to have communities that will never be able to access that treatment. They'll just be too expensive. And so what happens, which is what usually happens in every epidemic and pandemic, the rich will be able to buy their way out of a pandemic and the poor will, will not. Mm. I, I want to move to uh, a couple of questions from, from the audience. Uh, first, uh, first question is, what role can scientists and academics play in advocating for vaccine equity and show meaningful support for something like the TRIPS waiver? Uh, yeah, great question. So there's already been, you know, as part of the CROI conference, there's been something called the CROI Declaration on, on Vaccine Equity. And there's been, which is different from the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic, is that within the space of a few months, we have scientists and academics, particularly IP epidemics, who are also coming out on the side of activists who are calling for a TRIPS waiver. So I think there's two things that can be done. The one is to join the global you know, calls for solidarity and signing on to the different declarations, uh, which are really just words. But, but I think the more important thing that can be done is in the relationship and the contracting and the ethical research uh, that one has to undertake with these pharmaceutical companies, there has to be a greater questioning of why are we doing clinical trials and research for you? or at your request, if we are not going to ensure global universal access. If there's no post-trial meaningful access, I mean, what is the point of scientific research if you can't benefit from uh, the fruits of scientific knowledge? I mean, the irony of that, though, is that we did four clinical trials in my country, 
my friends and family took part in the J and J Aspen AstraZeneca Novavax trial, and we were not guaranteed access um, upfront. Uh, in fact, other countries like Canada and Australia that maybe did less even on clinical research were able to benefit as priority customers on vaccine access. So I think that that is one of the questions of. We can't have a repeat of this with the treatment. We can't have a repeat of this now as vaccines potentially come onto the market as booster shots to deal with the multiple variants. And then as academics, I mean, I think there's a there's a movement of progressive academics that are doing two things. One, calling for the trips waiver, but secondly, calling out the racism. And what's been surprising in the last week is that academics and scientists, for example, in South Africa have decided like enough. They're just speaking out about the racism about being on the receiving end of two things, the travel, well, three things, the travel ban, vaccine inequity, which we believe has led to the situation of more variants, uh, but then also what they are calling the appropriation of data from the global south. So we, doing the work, doing the research, presenting and sharing the data, and then the data that's taken by, by the global north. So I think, you know, this pandemic, uh, I think Aaron Dr. Roy had written about it, right? It's a portal to, to, to the systemic inequalities and, and global, issues that we've always had to be dealing with. And the pandemic is, this pandemic, I think is just bringing to the fore all of the issues that we've neglected for the last 25 years after the HIV AIDS crisis, because we got the DARD declaration and we thought the world would never do this to us again. Uh, but here we are, we're in the exact same position, if not worse. I, I, uh, I appreciate deeply that point. And it's, it has been a scale-free accelerator uh, of the, the mechanisms of inequity. and. Whether you're talking about inequity on a global scale or inequity on a local scale, we've watched as low-income people and people who've been historically marginalized by colonialism and, and, and racism um, constantly be on, 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 on the worst end of things. And that's just on the healthcare side. We haven't even talked about the economic consequences and the impact that travel bans have on an economy and, uh, and disproportionately on the lowest income people in, in that economy. I want to quickly, uh, we've got about one more minute, and I just wanted to ask you, we, we were uh, honored to host Dr. Uh, Gebreyesos um, here at, uh, at the university, uh, and he expressed some really profound concern about the inequity of people in the United States, as you mentioned, getting their third shots before uh, a lot of folks got their first shots uh, abroad, in particular in, in, in much of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. And I, I want to ask you um, if you could just comment on, on your perspective on um, the ethics of this issue, and in particular, the, the fact that you know, people point to hesitancy, but hesitancy is a function of uh, information. And um, the reality of it is that uh, we gave disinformation a lot more of a head start because of the lack of access to vaccines early on. Um, so I'd love to hear your, your perspective on this. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad you said that because that's the point we've been trying to convey, that timing matters so much in a pandemic. And so if we're seven months behind you in vaccination, that's when you have best, you know, hesitancy in the anti-vax movement growing. But I think that the WHO DG, um, you know, has been right on the money and he's been calling out the inequity since day one. It's not just the booster shots. And I, I agree with you, it's totally unethical to be doing third and fourth shots um, when most people, including healthcare workers in Africa, haven't been vaccinated. They haven't even protected the front line. 7% vaccine rate in Africa is actually shameful. One in four healthcare workers in Africa have only been vaccinated. That means three out of every four people who are you know, working in a hospital or in a clinical facility are not vaccinated. So I think the inequity is not just about the booster doses or the unethical part, not just about the booster doses. It's the fact that all healthcare workers and people over 70 in every part of the world have not been vaccinated. And he asked for that in February. He said this in January, February already, that before we administer even first shots to, to all, somebody like you or somebody like me, let's make sure that we reach the people who are most at risk. And, and, you know, people said they would do that and then they didn't. And that is what we call vaccine nationalism. It's difficult, of course, because a lot of these countries are saying, but our people, people who voted for us have said that we've got to protect our own first. But I think that's at the heart of the, of, of the inequity, is that the nationalism that we've seen has been of such epic proportions that of the 7.2 billion doses of vaccines administered in the world, the majority went to high income countries. That tells you that um, we really don't just have an ethics problem, but we also have an equity, a human rights, a systemic, an IP. It's, you know, everything has, has culminated, which 
is perfect breeding ground, I think, for hesitancy, for new variants to circulate, um, for irrational responses, which are couched in public health language, and then obviously for, for greater uh, inequity, which is, you know, all of, all of the things that an anti-vax movement is thriving on right now. Well, I really, really appreciate uh, this opportunity to engage in conversation, and I'm going to um, go ahead and thank you and then hand it back off to Professor uh, Parthasarathy, uh, who's going to take it from here. Thank you so much, Abdul and Fatima. That was just a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, so important, and I think you did such an extraordinary job of conveying the gravity of the situation, and not just the gravity, but I think it's sometimes difficult to see how seemingly technical decisions, um, you know, as you said, why are we doing this research in the first place? What is the point uh, if we, we are not ensuring access is, is something that uh, I think a lot of the folks on the Zoom, especially, you know, a lot of our um, community comes from the sciences and engineering and, and that's really what brought them to be part of this program. And so that's something that I think is very motivating for a lot of a lot of my students and a lot, as I said, in our community. But but in addition to that, I think that the um, the you know your your perspective from South Africa is something that is extremely important and yet we don't hear enough um, in the West. Uh, and so I really appreciate that. And um, I am so thankful that you're out there fighting this fight and I hope that you have, uh, that we have something to be optimistic about uh, <laughs> moving forward. Uh, and Abdul, thank you so much for your wonderful um, um, provocations and inter and being such a wonderful interlocutor. I think again, kind of connecting the debates temporally between the HIV AIDS crisis and the current pandemic um, in South Africa, but then you know, the global context in the US and the debate about drug prices is so important because I think there are lots of places where we can all intervene um, in addressing this nexus of health equity, intellectual property and science and, and hopefully that gave some of the viewers some ideas about, about how they might do that. So thank you both very, very much. I greatly enjoyed this. Um, and uh, thank you, Fatima, for managing all of the technical challenges to be with us today. I'm sure you have a super busy schedule. Um, so we'll see you both soon, I hope. Take care. <laughs>